Uh, reading two of Greg's books, um, uh, the first one, Tattoos on the Heart, uh, is just beautiful. And, uh, and uh, it's really touched me uh, over the weekend. And his subtitle is The Power of Boundless Compassion. Um, and uh, the title that we used for today's uh, guest presentation was Greg's newest book, The Whole Language, The Power of Extravagant Tenderness. And, and Greg and I were talking a little bit earlier. Uh, he's welcome to talk about that or not, uh, as he is called and sees, and sees fit. So um, I, I believe, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hope that we all have a sense of Greg's bio. I won't go uh, extensively into that. Um, Greg is uh, a Jesuit priest. Uh, and uh, in 1992, um, <clears throat> coming out of the D D Dolores Catholic uh, Mission Catholic Church in Boyle Heights in, in downtown L L.A., founded a Homeboy Industries, which is now the world's largest uh, intervention, rehabilitation, and re-entry organization for for gangs in the world, the largest in the world, I believe we can say. And um, so Greg will, I hope, talk to us a little bit about this. Uh, just one last quick word, and then I'll mute myself and, and turn this over. Uh, Greg and Bernie actually crossed paths, and maybe he'll mention this. Uh, uh, fairly recently, and I believe Eve w was <clears throat> was there as well. So, uh, uh, so we 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 are we are not even one degree of separation. We are we are connected in that sense. Greg, I hope that was uh, a, a worthy introduction. With that, I will turn my microphone off and hand it over to you. And thank you so much for being here. Sure, my my pleasure. Um, so you know. Uh, uh i'm trying to just go speaker there we go yeah um so thank you for the invitation yes i love bernie i just finished uh, reading his uh instruction to the cook which maybe i read a long time ago but um i just love him and he came in uh eve uh like just shortly before he died i think and and i had uh he had invited me to go to Grayston Bakery many years ago, so I wandered up to Yonkers with a couple homies. So, um, uh, so that was uh, heartening. Um, yeah, so it's kind of chaotic here because uh, the whole reception area is uh, filled with uh, gang members, and uh, that's right next across there. So, um, so I that so I have homies who are posted up. I have a sign that says on a Zoom. So, but that won't stop them from pounding on the on the wall to just wave at me. So um, there you have it. So, um, but I'm privileged to be with all of you. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so Jeff mentioned that uh, I'm a Jesuit and Jesuits don't really, uh, it does, does cute so much uh, for homies here. Uh, they don't really know what that is exactly, even though we have, there are three of us, three Jesuits who work here. And uh, and so my office is glass enclosed. So um, you know, we'll get. We have several tour groups here right now, who are um, you know, and they walk through. And uh, so I had a homie named Osvaldo who has what the homies call a very a loud ass voice, and he came and he was giving a tour, and he had about twenty folks parked right in front of my office, and I was sitting here talking to some people and I waved faintly and um, and it was one of those uh, observe our founder in his natural habitat kind of moments and uh, and then I could hear Osvaldo he says this is Father Greg Boyle he is the founder of Homeboy Industries he is a jujitsu priest so I, I gave him some of my my best moves uh, to try to impress them so that's part of my heritage. I'm, I'm kind of half Buddhist, uh, half uh, Jesuit, I guess, you know. <clears throat> so all that stuff is kind of meaningful to me. But St. Ignatius of Loyola uh, in 1544, on February 27th, he was writing in his uh, spiritual journal and he used for the first time 
uh, this word. And then he proceeded to use this word uh, for the remaining 12 years of his life. And then he went back and he circled the word um, many times uh, throughout the course of his journal. And, and, and I speak Spanish, but I'd never heard this word before. And the word was acatamiento, acatamiento. And it, it comes from the word acatar, which means to look at something with attention. And so a lot of people thought it meant reverence, but he used the word reverence many times. So they, it gets translated as affectionate awe. And, and true enough, it's kind of about a mystical moment with his God but he didn't settle for a moment. He kind of held out for a movement. So it's really about a stance in the world, acatamiento, which is, and it gets translated as affectionate awe. And so more and more, I think that's kind of what we do here at Homeboy. And so the idea is to somehow, of all of us, to find our way out at the margins because that's the only way they'll ever get erased. And to somehow imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine <clears throat> nobody standing outside that circle. And so how do we dismantle the barriers that exclude? And how do we find ourselves standing uh, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless and with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear? How do we find ourselves standing with the easily despised and the readily left out? How do we find ourselves in this stance of affectionate awe, standing with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away? It's not about just where to stand at the margins, but how to stand there with affectionate awe, with uh, attention that's paid in a particular way. And so we inch our way to the margins and we brace ourselves because the world will surely accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And so you go to the margins and other voices get heard. It's, it's how it works. And so um, thousands of folks walk through our doors here, men and women. There are 120,000 gang members in LA County, 1,100 gangs. I suspect there's not a single one of them who doesn't know where we are and what we do. And, but it's a little bit like recovery uh, from, from drugs or alcohol. You know, it's, it's not for those who need help, it's only for those who want it. So you have to walk through the door and, and they'll walk through the door, the thousands of them, and uh, you know, like 15,000 a year is kind of what we tabulate. And, and they come with what psychologists call a disorganized attachment. You know, mom was either frightened or frightening and you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. Every single one walks through our doors. I'm trying to get them to quiet down because it's really noisy out there. Everyone walks through our doors, um, you know, barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace. And the only thing that can uh, scale um, those walls is tenderness. And, and uh, it, I, you know, Jeff kindly mentioned my, my latest book called The Whole Language, The Power of Extravagant Tenderness. And like all the titles that Simon & Schuster hates that I suggest, this was one of them. And it, it comes from a homie who uh, I had met this guy who uh, they wanted to deport to uh, Uzbekistan. And I went to go testify on his behalf and I knew him since he was a little kid. 
but I ran into a guy from the same gang and I said, hey, do you know this guy, David? He goes, oh yeah, we call him Russian boy. And he goes, I was locked up with him. He's a good guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, every night he would go to the hallway and he would uh, get on the payphone and he would talk to his mom and uh, he would talk Russian to her. And then he said, damn, gee, he spoke the whole language, which was his way of saying, uh, you know, he was fluent. So I thought, you know, how do we get to be fluent, uh, you know, where we can just um, speak the whole language of tenderness and for all its power and all its um, ability to soften people into a corner where they come to know the truth of who they are. <clears throat> At Homeboy, we're kind of allergic to the notion of holding the bar up <clears throat> and asking homies to measure up. Instead, uh, we want to hold the mirror up and tell people the truth that they're exactly what God had in mind when God made them. And then you watch people inhabit that truth. You watch them uh, become that truth and no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out and death can't touch it because it's huge. But that's what we do for a living here is we reach in and we dismantle these messages of shame and disgrace so that people can see themselves clearly. We want to speak the whole language of tenderness and and if it's true that a, a traumatized person is going to perhaps be inclined to cause trauma, it's equally true that a cherished person will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. I, I was just saw an ad on CVS uh, for the drugstore and it says, healthier happens here. And, and that's kind of what happens at Homeboy Industry. So, uh, you know, a reporter once asked me, uh, how's it feel to have saved thousands and thousands of lives? And I, of course, I don't know what that, what the reporter is talking about, because, you know, um, healing happens here, but it's, it's, it's a group effort. It, it's a communal experience. Everybody holds a piece, everybody, carries a dose. So I've never transformed anybody's life. And, and we're called not to go to the margins to make a difference, but to go to the margins so that the folks there make us different. And so you allow yourself to be reached by folks at the margins and you receive who they are. And everybody um, provides a dose of this uh, tender glance. And, and so gang members come here and they find the place uh, a sanctuary. And then they become the sanctuary that they sought. And then they go home to their kids and they present the sanctuary. And suddenly you've broken a cycle. And that's how, how it works, I think. Uh, so, you know, the hope here is to create a place that's safe where people can be seen and then they can, uh, uh, let me just see if I can get their attention. Help! Please, please, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. It's just, maybe you can't hear it, but it's just, it's a din that's quite um, alarming, like people are um, in a, I don't know what. So, uh, anyway, Please, thank you. So, um, so you want people to be safe and um, seen and then cherished, you know, even when the din is so loud out there. So, and, and so that's the kind of the whole point. Um, so Homeboy was started uh, in 1988 when, um, um, I was pastor, as was mentioned, of a very poor parish that um, had uh, largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other, which is not typical anywhere. Um, leading the LAPD to call my parish uh, the largest, you know, the place of the highest concentration 
of gang activity at all anywhere. And uh, so I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988. And I buried my 255th <clears throat> three weeks ago, a young man named Jacob. Uh, not all of them obviously from the Paris, but I know a lot of gang members. <clears throat> so I get asked to do this. And so we did a lot of things. We started a school uh, first because we had so many junior high, middle school age kids who had been given the boot from their homeschool. Nobody wanted them. So they were wreaking havoc in the projects. And so they were writing on the walls. They were violent. They were selling drugs. <clears throat> so I walked out to them and I would, uh, um, you know, say, uh, I'd kind of isolate them. And I'd say, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah, you know, I would. And, and, and then I couldn't find a school that would take them. So that kind of forced my hand. And so um, across the street from the, the church is our elementary school, our parochial school. And the first two uh, floors were grades K to eight, but the entire third floor of this huge concrete building was our convent where the nuns lived. So I gathered all the sisters together one evening in the living room and I sat them down and I said, hey, you know, um, would you guys mind, you know, moving out and, and we could turn the, the convent into a school for gang members. And they looked at each other and they said, sure. You know, that was the extent of their entire discernment process. So then we were off and running. So gang members came to our school in large numbers. Uh, before too long, they said, uh, if only we had jobs. And then, uh, and they're coming to the church was kind of created something of a disconnect. You know, people would sidle up to me, parishioners, and they'd say, you know, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? you know, good people in and bad people out. And uh, so, uh, which was a good kind of gospel challenge, I would say. And so then um, gang members kept saying, if only we had jobs. And so we kind of myself and the women in the parish, we marched around the factories trying to find felony friendly employers. And that wasn't so forthcoming. So we just invented things. We had a maintenance crew, a landscaping crew, a crew to build our child care center, all made up of rival enemy gang members from the eight gangs. And then in 90, some of you might recall after the verdict in Simi Valley uh, relative to uh, Rodney King, the entire city exploded. So every pocket of poverty ignited, except the poorest pocket, my parish. And so the LA Times wanted to know why that was. And uh, um, so I said, I don't know, you know, maybe it's because we had um, 60 strategically hired uh, rival gang members who had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang the night before. And more to the point of the question, a reason not to torch their own community. So, uh, the article appeared in the LA Times and in the day following, uh, a movie producer named Ray Stark in, summoned me to his Beverly Hills office. He happened to have $500 million. And <clears throat> he said, how should I spend my money? And uh, as I look back on it now, I see that I woefully undershot my request, but, um, I said, well, there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the school. You could buy it. Um, it has ovens, they don't work, but you could fix them and we could put hair nets on rival enemy gang members. And I don't know, they could bake bread and we could call it Homeboy Bakery. And that was the extent of my entire business plan. So anyway, and here we are today, 34 years later, um, of the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on the planet. And so we have 10 social enterprises. We have tattoo removal, lots of classes from meditation every day, 
to uh, anger management, to parenting, to grief and loss. We still have a school, lots of ways for folks to uh, finish their education. And, uh, and what else? And so um, free tattoo removal, no place on the planet removes more tattoos than we do. And uh, in a variety of businesses, restaurants and such. Um, so the idea probably began as a kind of a jobs centric thing. And now it's more healing, you know, healthier happens here. Um, so like the Buddhists say, you know, we greet people and we say, uh, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And so we return people to a, a, a deep and abiding sense of who they are. You know, Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? And, and that's the idea. You know, and at the centerpiece, of course, is our 18 month training program. So uh, 18 months sort of parallels <clears throat> the time it takes for an infant to attach to the caregiver. So it's about um, attachment repair. You know, that the neuroscience teaches us that we're all hardwired as human beings to believe the worst about ourselves and the worst about others. But the hope is uh, that you can change the rewiring, that cherishing actually changes, you know, the, the brain health and, and people get rewired to see differently and, uh, and so we kind of shifted some at midpoint, probably 15 years in from, from nothing stops a bullet like a job to uh, healing. And, and, it, and it was born of our experience that a employed gang member may or may not go back to prison. And an educated one may or may not go back to prison, but it became our guarantee and contention that a healed gang member won't ever reoffend. period. <clears throat> and so we've kind of stayed with that notion and, and it's, it's proven to be true. Uh, you know, the, a scripture scholar once said that uh, the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture was shame and disgrace. And I think that's quite right. Uh, you know, in the Acts of the Apostles, it has this one odd line where it says, and awe came upon everyone. I might add affectionate awe, acatamiento, and awe came upon everyone. And it seems to be the measure of health of, in any community at all may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So I'll, I'll tell a story. I, you know, years ago, uh, I was invited to Richmond, Virginia to speak to 600 social workers. And it was one of those, uh, what they call in the biz, a gang in service. So 600 social workers commandeer a hotel ballroom and they, uh, you know, they sign in, they get credits and nine to five, you know, they have workshops and keynotes and breakout groups. And, and I'd done many of these over the years. And so I um, figured I, I would do a keynote. And so <clears throat> I said, yes, and I bought a ticket. Um, well, a week before I was to fly, I, I pulled out the letter originally inviting me. And uh, to my horror, I discovered that I was to be the only speaker from nine to five all damn day. And I went, oh, as the homies would say, oh, hell no, I'm not going to be the only speaker. So um, I invited two trainees in, Andre and Jose, and they were like in their ninth month of their 18 months. And, <clears throat> and I sit them down and I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers 
and tell your stories. Take your time because we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I had never heard their stories and Jose gets up first and he's like, uh, I, he's probably 25 years old at the time. Gang member, tattooed, been to prison. Um, at that juncture in his ninth month with us, he was kind of a, uh, he had glommed on to the, uh, the substance uh, use uh, team. And um, he, you know, a man solid in his own recovery. And now he was helping younger homies and homegirls, um, you know, with their addiction issues. And so not only had he been to prison, he also had a long stretch um, as a homeless man, even longer stretch as a heroin addict. So he gets up in front of uh, 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasped. And he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish. And the whole room got whiplash going from a gasp to laugh. And then he continued, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California and she walks up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid and she left me there for 90 days till my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother came and she rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school each day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through and second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion, and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts. Well, into my adult years, because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded? if I don't welcome my own wounds. And awe came upon everyone, affectionate awe. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the proof, the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wound, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. In the end, what we're invited to do is to create a community of kinship where there is no distance that separates us, where there is no us and them, there's just us. And so our task is to ensure that there is no daylight that separates us, knowing that separation is an illusion. And so we try to stand at the margins, knowing that only the soul that ventilates the world 
with uh, tenderness has is the only thing that can really change the world. If you know systems change when people change, and people change when they are cherished, oh, nobly born. Remember who you really are. You know, there's a Christmas carol that says, uh, I think it's called Oh Holy Night, and it says, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yet it's a song about Jesus, and yet it's a song about Christmas. And yet it really is the job description of every human being, any proud owner of a pulse. You appear and the soul feels its worth. And I think that's how it is supposed to go. Let me end with this one last story, and then I'm going to open it up to you to ask questions. Um, you know, in the old days, I used to ride my bike in the middle of the night in the housing projects, and I would patrol the different eight gangs and just kind of see how people were doing and convincing people to go home and put that Uzi down. Are you sure you want to shoot that guy? That kind of thing. So I was in a lethal village one night and I was um, and I was talking to this group of gang members, about eight of them, and it was uh, in a darkened archway. And as I was talking to them, I could see that um, in the kind of the poorly lit parking lot, there was this kid we all called Bandit who uh, was running up to a car to sell crack cocaine, which is what folks did in those days. And after he made the sale, he was walking back to where uh, he didn't know I had arrived. And I wish I could say he was embarrassed, but he wasn't so much. And uh, he always avoided coming to Homeboy Industries for help until one day he did. So in recovery, they say it takes what it takes and gang recovery is no different. It can be the death of a friend or the birth of a son or a long stretch in prison. I'm not sure what it was in his case, but finally he walked through the door and I couldn't believe he did. And he says what gang members often say, I'm tired of being tired. And so he began his 18 months with us and he came to terms with what was had been done to him as a child and what he had done. And he transformed his pain so he didn't have to inflict it anymore. And honest to God, if his story had been a flame, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of his childhood. And so he, he as we say around here, he, he did the work and he became sturdy and resilient and, and uh, he was ready to leave us. And of course, the world would throw at him what it will, but this time he was uh, not going to be toppled by it. And so not only do we have our 18 months training and healing, really, we have that moment where you get move on to the next job. And so you want, we want that transition to be seamless. And in parentheses, all of us on this screen know that healing ends in the graveyard. Uh, but around here, we talk about kind of foundational or essential healing. And um, so uh, they found him a job, our job developers, in some kind of warehouse, the first kind of job, uh, entry level. Cut to, you know, three years later, he was the floor manager. Five years later, he was running the whole show. He married his childhood sweetheart from the projects. He had three daughters, bought a house in La Puente. And uh, no news is good news. I hadn't heard from him in a long time. But one Friday afternoon, he calls me with kind of panic in his voice. And he says, gee, you got to bless my daughter. And I said, que paso, Mico? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my Jessica. 
but she's just 18 years old and she's a little chaparito, a little tiny thing and Humboldt's far. Do you think you could give her a blessing before she heads off to college? I said, of course, tomorrow is Saturday and I have a baptism at one. Why don't you come at 1230 and uh, we'll do a little send off prayer. And, and they all show up, Bandit and his wife and the three girls, including tiny little Jessica. So I, I, we stand in front of the altar inside the church and I put her in the middle and I say, let's surround her with our bodies and our love and everybody touch her and put your hands on her head and on her shoulders. And I tell them to close their eyes. And as the homies say, I do a long ass prayer. You know, I go on and on and somewhere in the middle of this thing, I notice everybody has become chiones. You know, we're all, we're all weeping. And I don't know why we're crying exactly, except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except for me, certainly nobody in their families. And so, you know, we kind of wipe our eyes and, and laugh at how mushy we got. And so to change the subject, I look at Jessica and I said, hey, what are you gonna study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. And I go, damn, forensic psychology. And, and Bandit says, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. And she looks at her father and she does one of these, you know, and, and he laughs and he says, yeah, I'm gonna be her first subject. So we go out to the parking lot and um, everybody says goodbye and big out Russell's, they pile in the car, but Bandit hangs back and I'm glad he has. And, and I said, hey, can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears and it takes him a while before he can speak. And he says, you know what? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada. I guess I showed them. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. I think we're not just being invited where to stand at the margins, but what is our stance once we get there? How do we allow ourselves to be reached by the widow, orphan, and the stranger? How do we permit our hearts to be altered? How do we return each other to ourselves and, and so that people feel safe, seen, and cherished? How do we look at folks in the eyes and say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are? The homies here say, you know, we're used to being watched, but we're not used to being seen. And that's the hope is we all get returned to ourselves in the process and we find our true selves in loving. And pretty soon we cease to care if anyone accuses us of wasting our time at the margins. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness the voices of those who sing. All right, I open it up to you guys. Thank you so much, Greg. And uh, uh, everybody, we've got, uh, we've got most of 20 minutes here. Uh, Greg's given us an hour of his day uh, and I can't see everyone because we're on two screens. So if you can use your electronic hand, uh, if you have a comment or a question or just a reaction, uh, and, and if we if we keep them shorter, maybe we can have time for a number of people to comment. So uh, Engu, please, uh, I see that you've got your hand up. There you go. 
thank you so much, uh, Father Greg. That was amazing, and your books are really wonderful. I love them. And I'd love to hear you talk about j joy, the role of joy in, in the healing, because uh, you, you, bring it, you bring it in in the whole language, and I like joy, so. Um, yeah, joy is pretty good. Um, you know, part of the thing is everybody thinks that the spiritual path or um, mystical activism or living as though the truth were true is always something of a grim duty, but it's where the joy is. It's, and, and so the whole task, of course, is to discover your true self in loving. And then it has no regard for return, you know, because then it's love never stops loving. Um, you know, it, in 1 Corinthians, it has that line, love never fails. But I, I read a, a translation recently where it says love never stops loving. Oh, I think it's way better because why would we, you know, get into the area of success and failure? It's not very helpful or even to measure things. You know, I, I a fundamental, two fundamental beliefs here uh, at Homeboy is that everybody's unshakably good and that we belong to each other. So... Um, so you don't want to measure goodness because it's not necessary, only because everybody's unshakably good. Now, they may not be able to see that truth, but that's, we're all, um, you know, as Ram Das says, we're all just walking each other home. How do we love each other into wholeness, which is kind of the, the whole thing? And, uh, and it's joyful. I, you know, I know my first book was a little bit because uh, I buried so many kids and in those days, I was always trying to, I gave talks in such a way as to um, put a human face on these folks I was burying because they seemed not to count very much. And so that was the idea. Uh, and then I think my two subsequent books, probably there are more laughs in them because in the end, um, well, I never thought I was going to write another book or a third book, so I kind of got everything uh, in the first book. But then it was kind of like, um, around here I heard a, a homegirl who was giving a tour, uh, because everybody's so loud here, and she's, I could tell, I could hear her say, here at Homeboy, we laugh from the stomach. And I knew exactly what she meant. You know, we laugh from the stomach, which is more about, it's not frivolity or su certainly not superficial, it's joy. And uh, what we mainly do here is laugh, which is quite extraordinary. And, and people who uh, carry so much and have suffered so much that love is a kind of the it's the promise, you know, and, and it's the invitation. And so we're not invited, you know, uh, the invitation is not, our hope is not to become a behaving community, but a beloved community of belonging. You know, Homeboy does what it does and it helps who it helps, but it's, uh, you know, it wants to be the front porch of the house everybody wants to live in. So it's funny, I was at a conference once and uh, it was a gang conference. I was speaking at it, but then I was also kind of sitting and listening to the other presentations. And a guy got up and he had a, 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 a kind of a gang intervention program that he was touting and he was pounding on the podium and he says, listen, people, this works. And I remember I wrote in my program, yeah, but I bet it doesn't help. And later on, I looked at my notes and I, I kind of went, oh, well, where did that come from? And I realized that not everything that works helps, but everything that helps works. So, you know, and I can tell this on myself because I'm, I'm a, a priest of the Roman Catholic Church, but the church, you know, you know, many hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it kind of backed this sin horse, you know, 
And so, and the whole idea was to try to keep people in line. And the only reason any of us went to mass on Sunday was because we thought we'd go to hell if we didn't. Did that work? Yes. Did it help? No. And, and so rather than um, frighten people, you want the invitation to be precisely to what you said, which is joy. You invite people to the fullness of life. And we've never really trusted that. You know, we've always wanted to scare people straight. And, and you can only care people straight. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's the power of cherishing. And so, you know, like in, in 12 step programs, they talk about one day at a time. And, and around here, we talk about one breath at a time. You know, you, you have to choose, that's your intentionality. That's, that's your, your, um, your practice is to cherish with every breath you take. And uh, it's hard to do, especially when you're trying to quiet them all down out there. <laughs> anyway, I hope that makes sense. Ingrid, thanks for your question. And Greg, uh, thanks for your answer. Um, Barb, uh, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead and unmute and share. Thank your... you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time today, Father Boyle. Sure. Um, I've just started working with the community in Buffalo that's been so impacted by the shootings. And I wondered if you'd speak to something that I've heard several times from that community, which is, and by the way, I would follow the group that's helping them to the end of the earth called Black Women for a Positive Change. They're just amazing humans. Anyway, I'm hearing a lot of this, which is um, we get a lot of pleasant and we really want present. And um, when you're at the margins, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how you bring presence instead of just being pleasant. And thank you. Um, I feel like I'm rarely pleasant, so it's hard for me to um, to connect fully. But I, I yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think part of the problem is why do the question I ask myself sometimes is why don't we make progress? And I think part of it is we name things incorrectly. So anything that says us and them count me out because I know it's, it's demonizing and it's, and it's, it's not the mystical way to see. And, and we, we need a change of glasses. We need, you know, new lenses that will help us kind of see these things, you know? And, and there, we're always pushing people away they don't belong to us. And, um, and I think if, if we stay anchored to those two truths, everybody is unshakably good and we belong to each other. There are no exceptions to either of those things. Then I think we'll make progress. But, you know, I was reading a book the other day um, and I hope this isn't off track, but Matthew Dowd and in it, he says, he asked the question, why, why did it take a hundred years from the end of reconstruction to Emmett Till and voting rights and, and, and uh, civil rights. And he answers this, the question this way. He said, because a third of the American people do not believe that all men and women are created equal, which is kind of startling. And then he says, why did it take, I don't know, 60 years from Martin Luther King to Donald Trump? And he said, because a third of the American people don't believe that all men and women are created equal. I think he's probably correct. But, the, but now name those people. Who are those people? If they're bad people, count me out. If they're morons, count me out. If they belong to us and they're unshakably good, but now I'm listening. Who are those people? None of us are well until all of us are well. How do we walk each other home? How do we love each other into wholeness? Nobody healthy, well, or whole has ever gunned down 10 people outside a grocery store in Buffalo. That's never happened. 
or killed all those kids in the Uvalde. It's never happened. And none of us are well until all are well. I, I, I think we have an absolute mental health crisis. Nobody well invades Ukraine. Nobody healthy slaps Chris Rock. Nobody well shoots up a subway train in Brooklyn and we all belong to each other. So how do we roll up our sleeves and make progress and help people? Gang members have taught me this. I've never met an evil person in my life, ever, ever. I've met traumatized people. I've met really damaged people. I've met people who carry more pain than most. I've met wounded people, but I've never met an evil person. And I know more gang members than any, probably anybody on the planet. I don't know, somebody might presume that I, I might have met someone who fits that description. No, no, gang members have taught me that. And so, I don't know, uh, us and them, you know, it's because I don't think we name things correctly and it matters how we name things. If, if we misname what this is, you know, it's why we don't make progress. We, our diagnosis is so off. So, you know, I can be against hate, which is kind of self-congratulatory. And somebody will say, wow, you mean you're in favor of love? Well, well, come on. People are in pain, people are wounded. You know, I've had gang members do all manner of thing here at this office. And, you know, the question we all ask around here is what language is that violent speaking? And, and that's what we hope to, you know, to kind of address. Let's address the pain. So I, I learned early on that gang violence is, is about something else. What's it about? It's about a lethal absence of hope. All right, let's try to uh, supply hope to uh, folks for whom hope is foreign. Let's infuse hope. And, you know, so I, I don't know, I think that's an important piece because no treatment plan worth a damn has ever been born of a diagnosis that was incorrect. So it's important to get it right, I think. Barb, thanks for your questions, uh, and Greg, your, your answer is wonderful. Jacqueline, you've got your hand up. Please uh, go ahead and unmute. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is just wonderful, um, what you're sharing with us. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you ever feel fear in the work that you do, and if you do, what do you do about that? I don't really do fear, you know, I, I have my own kind of practice and my own kind of prayer and meditation and, and uh, my own kind of belief system, you know, I believe that God protects me from nothing, uh, but sustains me in everything. I, the other day I asked a homie, I said, how do you pray? And he says, I sit there in silence by myself and I just pray hold me, which I liked. I thought that was pretty good. In fact, that became my, uh, my mantra uh, for many weeks after he told me that, hold me. And so I don't really do fear. I don't do disappointment. I don't do success or failure. I don't do, uh... yeah, so I mean, I, you know, if I'm afraid of anything, it's meeting payroll on Friday, but, but you know, mainly that. And plus you always wanna have a light grasp on everything, on, on life itself, you know. Or as the Dalai Lama says, when somebody asked him about his, his own death, he said, change of clothing and I'll, I'll have what he's having. 
I don't know if that's a good answer, but I, I kind of don't do fear. Fear comes from being attached and you don't want to be. Thanks, Jacqueline, and uh, thanks for your answer, Greg. Uh, Kathy Solomon, you've got your hand up, and I think we, we, we've got a couple of minutes here, so a short, yeah. qu short question will be good. It's a short, quick question, Father Greg. I was a volunteer there for years, and how do I get back in? And I've been knocking on the door. I know it's been tough with COVID and everything, but I... I loved volunteering there. Yeah, come back. You know, I, I'm dying to come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we're 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 kind of in full swing again. Um, you know, it's uh, everybody who works here has to be vaccinated, um, and you know, but you know, we don't check at the door except in our tattoo removal clinic. Um, everybody has to wear a mask in there because the doctors order it and everybody has to be vaccinated even to walk in the door. Um, we, we, yeah, we, we still have all our educational things, GED and high school and, and just accompaniment, you know, where people kind of are helping folks uh, navigate, you know, stuff from taking the driver's written exam to whatever it is, you know, a lot of folks are you know, they 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 appreciate. You know, I, the volunteers, especially younger folks, will kind of say, "What am I going to do here?" And I always say, "No, wrong question. What's going to happen to you here?" And so that's kind of the notion. You know, we want to be able to get people to a place where they allow themselves to be reached by people. You know, we're not that interested in. Uh, I remember a woman wanted to volunteer and she said, I have to volunteer there. I go, why do you have to volunteer here? She said, because I believe I have a message these young people need to hear. And I went, yikes. I said, do me a favor. The minute you lose the message, come on back, you know? So we, we want people who can, you know, like yourself, who, who receive people and, um, and that is so, uh, people feel, inhabit their, uh, their nobility and their own dignity radio. when that happens. Don't do that. Don't say radio. So do I come sit with the homies and wait to see you? I don't know how to get back in. Yeah, um, just come on in. Just come on in. But okay. email me and then I'll, I'll make sure it happens. Thank you so much. I so sure. appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. And thank you all for your questions. And uh, uh, Father Greg, we, 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 we promised to keep it to an hour and we know you're busy and, and we know uh, you have uh, you have people outside your door who might break through at any minute. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to honor our time commitment. Um, and uh, uh, I just so appreciate your time and, and your sharing. What a rich hour we've had. And um, uh, I want to remind everyone, if you want to learn more about Homeboy Industries, uh, we, uh, homeboyindustries.org, I believe is the URL, Greg. And, um, and as uh, Engu stated earlier, too, and as I mentioned, I spent the weekend reading Tattoos on the Heart and the Whole Language. Uh, we highly recommend these three books. They're, they're wonderful. And um, so um, there's a bit of a bit of a commercial plug there, Greg. So, and uh, Greg donates uh, all of the proceeds from the books to Homeboy Industries. So you're you're making a donation by by reading, uh, buying and reading the books.